Hi, Bookish Besties. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you're already subscribed, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. Today, we are here to talk about seven books that define my reading tastes. <music> So there is a trend that I've seen going around. I believe it originated on Book Talk, where you were asked to provide the five books that you feel define you the most as a reader, that say the most about your reading tastes. And so I kind of wanted to go ahead and do it as well, but I found it to be very difficult to only select five books because I read very widely across a lot of genres. But not only that, in these genres, I feel like I read pretty widely in terms of like tropes and content and things like that. So when I was thinking of some of my favorite books, I was like, these books are absolutely my favorites and they do define my tastes but they're not necessarily representative of my entire tastes within the genre. So I did the best that I could but ultimately I think I'm going to go ahead and settle on seven books that define my tastes to give it just a little bit more of a well-rounded feel. So consider this the book two version of this challenge. Seven books that define my taste. I have them here next to me. They are in no particular order so we're just going to go ahead and run through them and of course if you've been with my channel for any length of time you're probably not going to be a stranger to any of these books. The first of course is The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid, which is a book that I consider one of my favorite books of all time. This for the most part I would classify as historical fiction. This is very much focused like in the 1950s, 1960s, and it's surrounding a Hollywood starlet. This follows the rise of Evelyn Hugo through stardom in Hollywood during the period of classic Hollywood days and the things that she has to do to increase her stardom and she's perhaps most notable for her seven husbands. So in this story you're following her as she has reached old age and she's kind of very much alone in her life. She's lost a lot of the people that she's loved and she's finally willing to tell her story. And so she reaches out to a journalist, not a very well-known journalist. She's kind of an obscure journalist. Nobody really knows who she is, but she wants this particular journalist to tell her story. So you're following that journalist in the present. I believe her name is Monique, if I remember correctly. So you're following Monique in the present as she's getting Evelyn Hugo's story. And you're also following some of the things that are happening in Monique's personal life. And then of course, you're following the past perspective of Evelyn Hugo as she's actually living these things and as we're focusing on her seven husbands, the story behind them, and who was really Evelyn Hugo's true love. This is one of the most beautiful books that I ever read and the reason why I feel like it defines my taste overall is just because it's a very character driven story. Obviously you are following Evelyn Hugo throughout the entirety of the story but she's also a very complicated and a very flawed woman. You don't necessarily like her throughout the entirety of the story and I don't think that you're meant to but at the same time you are rooting for her. You're kind of like yeah girl go get yours you know what I mean because this is during a time that is not friendly to women in any shape or form, especially in Hollywood. You know what I mean? She's not really taken seriously. She has to do a lot of things she might not otherwise have done just to kind of get ahead in this world that is completely dominated by men. And the end of this book absolutely gutted me. And so anytime a story can make me sob and emotionally connect the way that this book does, it instantly becomes a favorite. But the reason why this doesn't necessarily reflect my taste in the historical fiction genre as a whole is just because I typically prefer World War II historical fiction. Like that's kind of like my niche when it comes to historical fiction, which is actually a little bit odd considering the next book that I'm about to feature is also more historical fiction in nature. And it's also not World War II historical fiction. And that is The Great Alone by Kristen Hanna. Kristen Hanna in general is one of my favorite authors of all time. And I could have easily featured The Nightingale in this video, which is definitely one of the best World War II historical fictions that I've ever read. But The Great Alone still stands today as my favorite Kristen Hanna of all time. And the reason why I feel like this defines my taste is because of the atmospheric harrowing nature of this story. This follows a husband, wife, and their daughter who moved to the rurals of Alaska. The father in this story is a Vietnam veteran. He is a very unstable person. He is a very temperamental and abusive person. And he thinks that moving to Alaska is going to solve all of their problems. And so he ups and moves them to Alaska. And needless to say, things only get worse. They're in survival mode all the time. And there's a lot of darkness, especially during the winter. So when they move there, like during the spring and summer, it's all fine and everything's great. But when the darkness moves in outside, the darkness moves in within the family and things really, really start to escalate with the father and things go down. It was absolutely such a harrowing journey watching our main character in this, who is a young child at the time and she's going through all of this and she's having to deal also with a mother who doesn't defend her, who doesn't try to get her away from her father or anything like that. So it's a very precarious situation. So not only are you in this very destructive, toxic family, but you're in the middle of nowhere. They're in a place that they've never been before. They've never had to survive in the way that they have to survive in the Alaskan wild. But what was also beautiful about this is 
how our main character actually kind of frees herself from the situation and the found family that she finds in this very, very small community. I just thought that it was beautiful. And in true Kristen Hanna form, you get these very well-developed, complicated characters. You get this wonderful atmosphere that is also a character within this story. And it was just perfection. I would say that Kristen Hanna in general is representative of my reading tastes, but specifically The Great Alone. So kind of moving on to the fantasy genre, I don't believe that I would have been able to talk about fantasy without, of course, mentioning Nevernight by Jay Kristoff, which is the first book in the Nevernight Chronicles, which is my favorite fantasy series of all time. This is another situation, though, where I don't feel like this is widely reflective of my overall fantasy reading tastes, because this is very different, I think, than any of the other fantasies that I have on my shelves. This follows Mia Corberry, and she is an assassin. When she was young, she watched her father be hung for treason. Her mother and baby brother were hauled away. She never knew what happened to them. She's presumed them dead this whole time, and she vowed to get revenge. So she's kind of taken under the wing of Mercurio, and then Mercurio actually sends her to the Red Church, which is essentially a school for assassins. And this is all about her journey within that school, and it evolves throughout the series. I absolutely adored the story. First of all, I think Jay Kristoff is a flipping genius. His humor is unmatched. His humor is a lot like mine. So there were definitely parts throughout this series, even though it is a very adult series, it is very graphic at points. But even despite that, there were still parts where I was laughing throughout the series, just because I absolutely love Jay Kristoff's humor. There are footnotes in this series, which I know put a lot of people off, but I feel like they added a lot of great context to the overall story. And you don't have to read them if you don't want to. And if you listen to this, the footnotes are actually incorporated into the narrative. So you don't actually know that you're listening to the footnotes. You know what I mean? It makes it a little bit more of a seamless reading experience. But if you are reading it physically, you don't have to worry about reading the footnotes. So I just wanted to put that out there in case that has been putting you off of the story. I loved Mia Corberry. She was incredibly badass. And she actually has a shadow cat, Mr. Kindly. And of course, he's very sassy. He's trying to keep her on track. He's trying to be a guide to her as well. And of course, he's an absolutely phenomenal character. So this fantasy has a lot of things that I really absolutely enjoy. But this again, fantasy has so many sub genres. And I feel like if you love fantasy, there's an infinite amount of possibilities for what you could be reading within that genre, which is why it was very hard for me to just choose one book for the genre. So I chose a second one. And that second book is House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J. Mass, or really just Sarah J. Mass in general. I feel like all of her series are really representative of my taste. Throne of Glass is definitely my favorite of her series. But the reason I'm holding this one up is because this is Sarah J. Mass's first adult fantasy. And I feel like you can really tell that. And the reason why I love this was because of the complexity of the plot. There is definitely a lot of characters, a lot of politics going on here. It's definitely intricate in a lot of ways. It has amazing characters, just like any of the other series that she writes do. I think Hunt, for the most part, is my favorite Sarah J. Mass love interest that she has written. This book contains one of the most intimate scenes I've ever read in my entire life, but it really had nothing to do with sex. It's a shower scene. And if you know, you know, and it just tugged at my heartstrings and it made my chest ache. So I really do feel like Hunt is my favorite Sarah J. Mass love interest. And I wish I had been as invested in that relationship in House of Sky and Breath, but I wasn't. I was more interested again in some of the other side things that have been going on. But this I feel is just a wonderful adult high epic fantasy. And I loved the intricate nature of this. So I wanted to go ahead and mention it here because I do feel like this is very representative of my fantasy tastes overall. Now contemporary fiction is another genre that is so wide and it encompasses a lot of things. So it was very hard for me to find one contemporary that I wanted to feature. But I definitely think that Part of Your World by Abby Jimenez is a great representation of my tastes in contemporary fiction, especially contemporary fiction that features heavily a romance. This follows the relationship between our two main characters, Alexis and Daniel. They meet by chance one night when Alexis has kind of run herself into the ditch in the middle of nowhere in a small Minnesota town. She's on her way home for a funeral. She swerved to avoid an animal. She ends up in a ditch and Daniel pulls up behind her and tows her out. They end up finding each other once again in this watering hole. It's like one of the only things that is open at the time. Alexis, she needs to go to the bathroom. She needs to eat. So she ends up there. Daniel is also there and they end up having a one night stand with each other. And that's very unusual for both of them. And Alexis is freaking out about it. She's not handling it well, but they end up connecting again and developing a deeper relationship. Now, Alexis and Daniel are very, very different. Daniel is a very blue collar person. He's kind of like the honorary mayor of this small town. Everybody knows him. They kind of look to him for guidance and to take charge on things. But Alexis is from a very prestigious medical family where she is from. And they have this legacy at this hospital there where there's always been a Montgomery in residence. And Alexis is now slated to take that mantle because her brother's not going to be there to do it. And she doesn't want to. She doesn't want to be in that hospital, especially since she has a very toxic ex that is there. But she has to. She can't disappoint her family. And even though she's falling for Daniel and she loves Daniel, she knows that they really don't fit into each other's lives and that her family will never accept him. So you're following them as they develop this perfect, pure relationship. Daniel is truly one of the best male love interests that I've ever read in a story. Abby 
Kevin has, for the most part, writes incredible male love interests. And Daniel, he's just this perfect combination of cinnamon roll, but also like manly man at the same time. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think if you've read Abby Jimenez's books, you'll kind of know what I'm talking about. So he is wonderful. He loves Alexis so deeply and Alexis loves him too, but she doesn't know how to make this work. And so that's the harder hitting element that's going on in here. And they're being pulled apart just because of different life circumstances. And I really enjoyed how Abby Jimenez approached the issue. This is one of those romance stories that really just makes your chest ache. I was reading this and I felt like I was going through the breakup. I felt like I was going through the terrible time because of how well Abby Jimenez approached these topics and how real she made them. This to me is like one of the perfect contemporary romances. And I feel like it's very representative of my taste in the genre. And then last but certainly not least, we have the thriller genres. Now that is still to this day, the main genre that I read, mystery, thriller, suspense, all of that is what makes up the bulk of my reading for the most part. So I have two that I feel are really definitive of my reading tastes. First, I have Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. Now this book encompasses the dark gritty tastes that I have when it comes to thrillers. I love my thrillers to be dark and really not be afraid to go there. This follows our two main characters, Ike and Buddy Lee, and what happens when they find out that their sons who were in a relationship together were murdered. They're both seeking vengeance for what happened to their sons, but it's a lot more than that because first of all, neither one of them really approved of their son's relationship. So both of these men were kind of estranged from their son. And both of these men, for the most part, they think that they're very different. You know, one is black, one is white. They both have had very different experiences in their life, but they also have criminal histories. They definitely have darker backgrounds. And so they come together to avenge their sons. Now, I will say that this book is very violent, but it was satisfyingly violent. I can't put it any better than that. You want the violence that is in this story. You want the vigilante justice. This is one of those books that makes you love living in the gray area. You are okay with living in that gray area. And I just loved what S.A. Cosby was able to do with the story. S.A. Cosby has incredibly beautiful writing for somebody who writes such dark things. I have now read S.A. Cosby to zero. I have really enjoyed every single one of his books, but nothing has surpassed this for me. I loved these two men realizing their wrongs, coming to terms with their grief, seeking forgiveness from their sons who are no longer there to give it and realizing that they lost so much time that they can't get back and then working together to avenge their son's death. I just really appreciated this whole book. It was an easy five stars and I recommend it to anybody who feels like they can handle the violence in this story. And the last book that I want to talk about in this video is one that I feel is more general in terms of my thriller tastes but is one that has stuck with me ever since I read it and I consider it one of my favorite thrillers of all time and that is No Exit by Taylor Adams. This is the isolation thriller that I hold all other isolation thrillers to especially those that are set in a wintry atmosphere as you can tell by the cover alone. This is definitely a wintry isolation thriller. It follows our main character Darby and if I remember correctly she is attending college in Colorado but her mother is currently dying in a hospital in Utah and she is desperate to get to her. But of course it's Colorado in the winter and there is a blizzard and she's trying to make her way through this blizzard but her car just cannot stand it. So she pulls off into a very isolated rest stop. She is not the only one there. There are a handful of other people there but she's in a situation where her phone is almost dead. There's no cell reception anyway. She doesn't know these people and she doesn't know how long it's going to be before she's going to be able to leave. She doesn't know when the snow plows are going to come or anything like that. And at one point she is outside. She's trying to get cell reception. She needs to call her sister and let her know that she's on her way. And she's passing by one of the vans that's in the parking lot and she notices a cage. And in that cage is a child. And at that point, Darby realizes that she's stuck in the middle of nowhere in a rest stop with a kidnapper and possibly worse. And so this is about her journey of survival and her journey to also try to rescue the child in this van. And it was just one of the most atmospheric things I think that I've ever read in a thriller. I remember just being so completely absorbed and compelled by the story. And it was definitely edge of your seat at some point because you want to know what's going to happen. You want to know if she's going to be able to rescue this girl. You want to know who the kidnapper is, what is going on, what is the story behind this missing child. And I don't know, I just thought that Taylor Adams really encompassed the isolation vibes that you were looking for when you were reading a story like this. Wintry isolation thrillers are definitely my favorite subgenre of thriller. I absolutely gravitate towards those, but I haven't really yet found one that matches No Exit. It is still the wintry isolation thriller of all wintry isolation thrillers, in my opinion, and it 100% defines my taste. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are seven books that I feel define my taste as a reader. Of course, I would love to know what books you feel define your tastes as a reader. Please comment that down below. Or if you made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and just leave me a book stack emoji to let me know that you were here. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I typically post two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, one on Sundays, and I would love to connect with you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which you can always find linked down below along with any books I talked about in the video. Until next time, y'all.